Thank you, and thank you so much for having me here today. Um, it's such an honor to, to be in the company of and in conversation with so many scholars who've, whose work I've admired for a long time. Um, so as Wayne mentioned, I'm a museum anthropologist um, who's, I've worked for almost 10 years of head of anthropological education at the American Museum of Natural History, which is a role as a liaison between the anthropology curators and the education department. And uh, also, as Wayne mentioned, I'm now the director of museum studies at Bryn Mawr. So as my, my career can attest, I've long been interested in the kind of the tensions and interweaving between museum theory um, outside of the museum and museum practice within museums. Um, and today I'm going to share with you the research I conducted for my book, Envisioning African Origins, which was a study of Kenyan, British, and American museum visitor perceptions of Africa within the context of origins exhibitions. Um, their deeply weighted perceptions of their African evolutionary heritage. Um, and I just want to point out something I just learned, which you see this, this image that I have here, this historical image, is ironically reproduced almost in this room with hear no evil, speak no evil, <laughs> uh, which uh, I couldn't have planned better. Um, so I actually came to question the relationship between origins, exhibitions, and their audiences by eavesdropping on visitors while working in a research lab at the American Museum of Natural History. I became very concerned and perplexed with how visitors were interpreting the human origins dioramas. And one occasion stood out for me. I overheard a provocative conversation between a mother and her young child while standing in front of this display, which is a diorama of Homo ergaster in Africa, a diorama depicting a, co a couple uh, kind of carving meat and warding off imposing scavengers on the savanna. And the child, this was a white family, asked his mother, Mom, why don't we look like that anymore? And his mother pa his paused momentarily, then succinctly responded, because we left Africa. Pause. <laughs> um, so this dubious rationale took hold of me and inspired a chain of questions. What exactly happens when visitors encounter such provocative representations of human origins in museums? How do they make sense of them and integrate them into their identities? And what set of tools, whether pop cultural, intellectual, religious, racial, political, what have you, do visitors bring with them to exhibitions? And how do these things interact with what is being given to them? And so this is fundamentally where my interests lie, the cross-pollination between museums and other forms of enculturation. And in my experience, museums often try to insulate themselves um, from other media without addressing how influential the cultural stories external to the museum are to visitors' understanding of museum exhibitions, particularly stories that influence perceptions of visitors' own identity, uh, heritage, and ancestry. So before getting into some of the findings of my research with visitors, uh, visitors' own comments, I'd like to take a moment to consider uh, what contributes to the evolutionary image of Africa in the popular imagination. One example, um, and this is a photo of a South African Kung San man, um, which accompanied a Condé Nast Traveler article, which began, quote, as a species, we grew up and moved on. And if your particular adaptation is to be able to plan the future and remember the past, then getting out of the Kalahari will be something of a priority. Run, don't walk. In a blink of 10,000 years, you can be in downtown Manhattan with air conditioning and internet pizza delivery. But some people stayed behind. So, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> it's poignant. It is readily apparent that popular media have not altogether abandoned this century old representation of Aboriginal Africans as an evolutionary unique and inferior sometimes species. For the most part, Africa's distinction as the cradle of humanity has proven to be a double-edged sword for the continent. Through the popularization of anthropological discourse, Africa has been impressed upon many as the content from which we arose and eventually escaped. 
Uh, this vision out of Africa, emphasis on the out, has long inspired the crude teleological assumption of progress from ape to man, from Africa to Europe. And Africans accordingly have become integral to this narrative, offering bodily proof or the natural analogy of our deep evolutionary history. So that the continent, after achieving this once rather coveted position as cradle of humanity, often struggles against the persistent stigmatization as the fundamental, though ennoble, bottom rung. And of course, we have to bear in mind the important historical work of images of Africa in the museum and in anthropology. And I'm sure uh, with this audience, many of you are quite aware of this history. Um, this powerful convergence in the late 19th, early 20th century uh, museum of racial hierarchies that emphasize the visual and the seeming authentication of such images through anthropological science. So on the left is this um, 1868 ladder of progress by the influential American polygynist Naughton Glidden uh, with the Negro jaw artificially exaggerated. Um, as <laughs> you can see, there's one behind here which is quite similar um, to that representation. And in the middle, you can see a very early scientific reconstruction, clearly calling upon black features. And this was a reconstruction according to Hackle uh, in 1887. Um, so as many of you are well aware, the turn of the 20th century, the Natural History Museum emerged in many view venues as an important vehicle for anthropological education and simultaneously as a vehicle for the codification of some racist dogma. And I found that these ideologies have left persistent residues um, in the public, in the popular imagination today. Um, so the progress narrative. So this is one of the most iconic scientific images. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, but also one of the dis most destructive images to pervade evolutionary representation. And it's proven somewhat unyielding, deeply entrenched in all of us. Um, and the image vastly distorts the complexity of evolutionary arguments and evolutionary relationships, reinscribing Victorian notions of progress, culture, and humanity for 21st century audiences. And it's reproduced in many, many different museums in many different forms. So the legacy of Victorian anthropology very much lurks in the museum and evolutionary science today and has not been lost on some 21st century museum visitors. Because of the chronological layout of most human origins exhibits, misconceptions of linear sequential human origins predominate among museum audiences. Museum exhibits then serve to reinforce conventional evolutionary iconography, such as chains of being and ladders of progress that often extend from Africa to Europe, with Europe as the one singular representation of modern humanity, uh, Europe at the apex of human evolution. So it's almost as if Africa is the cradle of humanity, but Europe is the finishing school. And these progress narratives appeal to many audiences of natural history museums today as an intellectual and cultural crutch. They continue to serve primarily to comfort museum visitors, um, perhaps white, perhaps male visitors, in their identity and their relationship to the past. The image on the right is uh, at the Natural History Museum, London. Um, and there has been a lot of terrific theoretical museum studies work on how people interpret scientific and cultural media, the interpretive strategies that they use, but how does this all function in practice? How does this play out when various visitors are trying to determine what it means to come from African origins? Um, to understand this, I conducted questionnaires, interviews, focus groups among diverse audiences, diverse age groups in four museums, as mentioned, the Natural History Museum London, the Horniman Museum London, London, the National Museums of Kenya and Nairobi, and the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And my overarching finding uh, is one that I didn't set out to explore, but became the most significant finding nonetheless, especially for those of us working in museum studies. It's simply that the way museum visitors experience human origins exhibitions are profoundly, exceedingly complex. And I know it's okay to sort of smirk here. Um, sure, that seems obvious. Um, but the ways that museum visitors construct perceptions of African origins and the ways that they communicate um, these perceptions are naughty. This is a dense meaning-making atmosphere, the convergence of intellectual, emotional, and cultural networks of meaning, 
that audiences reconcile as they confront these evolutionary images and share their opinions. Um, and more specifically, first, as suggested, I found that visitor perceptions are shaped heavily by what they bring with them into the museum, a dizzying kaleidoscope of signification from pop cultural influences like National Geographic photos mentioned again and again, Sports Illustrated covers, films like Planet of the Apes, uh, not to mention previous schooling, museum visits, religious beliefs, family folklore about race, uh, you name it, it was there. Uh, second, among the images visitors bring with them to the museum um, was this notion of evolutionary progress um, from an evolutionarily inferior Africa. Um, and lastly, I did indeed find that visitors of African descent do represent a unique interpretive community, sometimes seeing both the science of human evolution and the museum itself through unique and strained lenses. And um, of course, I can only give you a crude glimpse here, um, a sampling of my, my analysis and the range of visitor comments, but a few highlights. Um, so a few representative comments of how it, audiences bring racially encoded progress narratives. A Horniman Museum visitor's questionnaire response, which mirrored several others, revealed her racial misconceptions as well as its roots. She believes African ape men are ancestors because, quote, it is what I've been told at school. Also, if you look to a colored person, their faces have more similarities to hominids than us. And she did say this to me. And as a side, I became very interested in probing the dynamics of the, of the interview space, my own identity. Um, one visitor revealed some of his own preconceived assumptions when answering the question, do you think of African ape men as ancestors? He responded, you know, one of these programs that I was watching said that there was a tribe in Africa that still lives, how would we call it, primitively. They're saying that Europeans and everyone, there's a common link with this tribe of people who have, you know, obviously not really gone anywhere. So here television is vaguely invoked in response to the question rather than the museum exhibit he just experienced. Um, and I witnessed these types of associations with things seen on television again and again uh, while working at the American Museum of Natural History, even while just passing through the African people's dioramas on the way to my office. Another example of racial misconceptions being internalized at th this time by a black Jamaican visitor to the Natural History Museum in London, he explained that he believed African ape men were ancestors, quote, because we as Africans possess hair texture unique to animals of far different quality than European hair. Finally, one American visitor to the Natural History Museum expressed his difficulty envisioning Africa as the cradle of humanity by explaining, no, I think Africa's status as a third world continent overshadows the role it played in the development of mankind. So comments like these reveal a conflation of Africa and African people of today with the Africa of the past, a misunderstanding of the deep scale of evolutionary time and the complexity of modern human diversity. And it does seem as though the years of kind of stereotypical images of a static primitive Africa have left an indelible mark on the popular imagination. Um, and lastly, I'll talk a little bit about um, my work at the, with audiences of, of African descent. Um, so those who identify culturally with the African continent, such as Kenyan, African-American, or Afro-British visitors, often had unique relationships to displays of African origins, at once intimately connected to, yet alienated by origins narratives that begin in Africa and end in Europe. So black interviewees often identified with Africa not only as the cradle of humanity um, and an important site of cultural heritage as well, um, but there were many more acutely critical or politicized responses regarding the museum and science from black audiences. So among audiences at all the museums, black visitors were more likely to initiate discussions with me regarding the racial implications of exhibitions. Occasionally, these, in, these interviewees um, subverted the conventional up from Africa evolutionary progress narrative. One Kenyan interviewee commented, for example, quote, the diorama should ex 
should explain better. It should teach to classify primitive according to how thin your lips are and how hairy you are. Then white people are more primitive. That's what I learned. An Afro-British visitor to the Horniman similarly commented, Europe is saying that we black people come from apes. Then they give out pictures making it look like apes are black. When they show apes on TV, they show you the black-skinned ones. They don't show the red-faced baboons or nothing like that. Particularly in the case of Kenyan museum goers um, that I interviewed, black visitors were often more quick to point out the complicity between colonialism and the museum. For example, Kenyan respondents often mentioned the exclusionary historical policies of the museum as an important impediment to Kenyan museum visiting today. So for example, one Kenyan interviewee commented, quote, for some reason, people don't come in here, but that has to do with the management, the association of the museum and the whole society as being a white thing. So Africans are not very interested in it. The Leakey family often arose in interviews when Kenyan visitors discussed their perceptions of the museum and science. One visitor, when asked whether he considered the Leakeys good or bad for the museum, responded, quote, it's a white thing. The Leakeys still carry colonialism in their minds. They wish it would go back, and they're not willing to admit their mistakes. They would never admit it, so that really puts me off. Museums are part of that cycle, and they're still in a way promoting it, probably unconsciously. So certainly some Kenyan visitors' experience at the National Museums of Kenya are strongly strained by preconceived notions of the museum and its politics. Um, also note that at the museum, I interviewed museum curators and leaders, including Richard um, and Meeve Leakey, as well as tour guides, security guides, educators, trying to get a full kind of sense or ethnography of how the museum works. Um, and bear in mind that in addition to the more straightforward racialized readings, I did encounter many negotiated responses among black audiences, or responses that re reveal the way that museum visitors belong to many shifting communities. Um, so a museum visitors, quote, racial or cultural readings might be complicated by their identity as a cosmopolitan museum visiting class. Um, and so obviously there are multiple ways that museum um, visitors can read museums and museum exhibits. No one visitor belongs to his or her cultural community alone. Um, but I think museums, particularly museum exhibitions of anthropology um, and human origins, are no doubt places where there's a negotiation of shifting identities, shifting communities. Um, and I'd like to close with a powerful comment I received from one visitor. Um, one Kenyan interviewee shrewdly commented when I asked him as to one display's meaning, a diorama. He, he said, quote, meanings are in people. This couldn't have been better stated. So while museum visitors learn some new ideas from human origins exhibits, they also bring some of themselves and some powerful preconceived images to bear upon what they see. But visitor preconceptions do not lessen the responsibility of the Natural History Museum as interventionist. Um, in fact, I think it places a greater burden on museums to relay more challenging and conscientious representations of our evolutionary and cultural heritage. Thank you. <laughs>